Hello, and uh, welcome to today's uh, episode on AI for Good, AI 2041, 10 Visions for Our Future. My name is Reinhard Scholl. I'm with the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and it is my pleasure to moderate today's session with uh, Dr. Kai Fu Lee. The ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. The ITU manages the international radio frequency spectrum and satellite orbit resources. Uh, the ITU develops standards, and the ITU assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. The ITU is also the organizer of AI for Good in partnership with 38 UN sister organizations and co convened by Switzerland. AI for Good is an always online, all year round uh, platform to explore how AI can help achieve the sustainable development goals. As usual, we count on your support to make this an exciting experience. So please use the Q&A functionality to send your questions. And please make sure that you send it to all uh, panelists and attendees, not just to all uh, panelists. And you can use the chat functionality for other uh, discussions. I think we would be hard pressed to find a better person than Dr. Kai Fu Li to give us a vision of what AI might look like in uh, 20 years time. Kai Fu Li got his PhD at Carnegie Mellon University with a thesis uh, on AI. He has spent more than three decades at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence, working for research, for development and investment in both the United States and China. Dr. Lee is chairman and CEO of Sinovation Ventures, a leading capital, a venture capital firm focused on developing the next generation of Chinese high-tech companies. Previously, Dr. Lee was the president of Google China and a senior executive at Microsoft, Silicon Graphics, and Apple. Dr. Lee is the author of the New York Times and Washington Post, uh, World, World Street Journal, it was uh, best-selling best -selling AI superpowers, which examines the role of the United States and China in the future of artificial intelligence, as well as its impact on the society. His latest book, uh, AI 2041, is going to be published in the United States today, co-authored with award-winning science fiction writer Chen Fan. and it is called AI 2041, 10 Visions for Our Future. We will give away 100 ebooks to those who connected, who are connecting first to today's session. Dr. Lee is joining us from BG. Welcome to AI for Good, uh, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thanks for having me. The uh, book is a bit of uh, an unusual book. Uh, the genre has been called uh, scientific fiction as opposed to science fiction or science fiction realism, which sounds a bit like an oxymoron. So could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. I, I'm uh, personally a fan of science fiction. It's inspired a lot of uh, technological advances, including AI. But I'm sometimes frustrated that uh, there's too much uh, fantastical but not realistic thinking. And at the same time, AI is such an exciting technology and it is here and it will be so much more in 20 years. And I wanted to uh, use the power of storytelling in science fiction to explain the importance of technological innovations in AI. So I work, decided to work with a uh, science fiction author, uh, Chen Chufan, and together we crafted uh, 10 stories that tell the future vision of what living in the future will be like in 2041. And we hope that these stories provide a compelling and even entertaining, uh, very readable stories, followed by uh, analysis that I wrote, describing how the technologies work, uh, what are the problems they'll cause, and how we might solve them. As I can confirm, the stories are <clears throat> very, very entertaining, very inspiring. I very much enjoyed uh, uh, reading the book. When Yuval Harari had said that uh, maybe arguably the most uh, important uh, artistic genre in the 21st century is actually uh, the science fiction writer. And he said that uh, science fiction you know, bears a responsibility to depict uh, the way things or science works uh, somewhat realistically. So you co completely con confirmed to that uh, aspiration. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
So how, how did you meet your, your co-author? Uh, yeah, we both used to work for Google and we knew each other a little bit then, but um, okay. we both left Google as, um, uh, you know, about um, 12 years ago. I founded a venture capital firm and we invest in AI and other technologies. And he decided to take a bigger change in career and he became a science fiction writer and quite a successful one. He's actually the president of Science Fiction Association for the Chinese uh, authors. And he's written several uh, uh, very good science fiction novels and we really hit it off. And, and I think most interestingly, he's willing to constrain his imagination to fit his stories in the context of technologies that are likely to work, not anything in his imagination. And I applaud him for that because I think many authors might not want their imaginations to be limited. So how did you come up with the plots? <clears throat> did you come up with plots? He came up with plots, uh, both of you together. I understand that the book was written during COVID. So I guess you had a lot of video conferencing sessions uh, to yeah. thank you in the plot. So how, how did you do that? Uh, he largely came up with the plots. I made small contributions, but um, the, the, the 10 stories were selected by four things. First, I wanted to come. Uh, go into depth to explain about uh, 20 types of technologies, maybe two per chapter. And I wanted to present them in an orderly fashion from the most basic to the most advanced so that people can build on their knowledge of AI and become an AI knowledgeable person at the end of the book. And I also wanted to apply AI to 10 different industries like healthcare or education so people can see the breadth of its influence. And, and, and Chiu Fan wanted to uh, write stories for in 10 different countries. I think very fitting for today's e event at UN because AI will impact all countries, all, all uh, countries equally. So we fitted everything back and forth and decided which story will be in which industry and which technology for which country. Um, once we fit that, figured that matrix out, he went off and wrote the first story and then we iterated and then I told him some of the key points I want to stress about problems of a particular technology and how we might either solve it or not solve it, depending on if you want a good ending or not such a good ending. Uh, so I, I participated, but he did all the storytelling. Okay. <clears throat> there is a, a law, a law in the sense of an insight, which is attributed to uh, Roy Amara and goes back to the 1960s. Uh, he's a computer scientist and I think uh, large part of the audience may have uh, come across it, that it goes like this. We overstate the impact of technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. Mm -hmm. so let's suppose that the short run is 10 years and let's say that the long run is 20 years. So what, uh, where might we overestimate the impact of technologies in the next 10 years and where might we actually underestimate the impact of technology in 20 years time? Uh, yeah, uh, so my business is venture capital investing. So our job is to estimate for 10 years because that's about the time from investment to exit. And we try to do so accurately, but in doing so, we do find sometimes um, in laboratories, products work, but when you actually pick, put it in the market, there are many realistic problems you have to solve. And that's why we are sometimes over optimistic in the short term. I remember when I worked at um, Apple and Microsoft back in the early days of speech recognition, uh, whenever my boss, including Bill Gates, would ask, hey, when will speech recognition really work? I would say in about five, in about five years. And unfortunately, I was not right a single time. Uh, it sort of barely works today now. And we're about to see it work really well in the next five years. But any earlier prediction would have been premature because I... Uh, because we see it working in the laboratory. We assume it should just work, but there are all kinds of problems like uh, applications, how do you program it? How much CPU does it take? The, is it resilient to noise? Can it work in a car? And we did not think about any of those problems. And, and those of course are now being fixed. I think that's kind of an example. Um, I think 20 years is definitely long enough that we would probably fall on the short, uh, fall on the side of underestimating the impact uh, if you think about the beginning of the internet, which is just about 20 years ago, right, in the 
uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000, if people said, hey, what's the power of the internet? I don't think any of us would have imagined that we would be ordering all our food, our mobile phone, or that our music, uh, that many devices have disappeared. Uh, we're watching videos and watching music on our phone, uh, or that uh, the search engine is one that you can ask questions and answers come out, or that social networks connect us together in many ways or that Uber uh, works and that a new, whole new class of Uber drivers as a profession has come about. So these are all very hard to predict. And I think if we took today, uh, the ver what we have in this world, the stories in this world, and went back in a time machine 20 years ago, I think all of us would have been surprised how much technology has progressed. And, and I, think, I think in this book, AI 2041, we're going 20 years in the future where I think progress will be accelerated because we're on a much better footing. Um, and also AI, if you look at the last five years for AI, it's been probably a hundred times of the 15 years before that in a window of 20 years. So I think we're kind of in the acceleration path. So I think we'll be even more surprised. So this book, if anything, is a conservative estimate about what the future would be like. I think there's potentially more, more drastic, exciting uh, scenarios. When you said you, you give it an 80% probability that the scenarios as you describe uh, might turn into reality by 2041. Mm -hmm. Yes, <clears throat> I try to do that. You know, there are many bases to make such projections. We have seen the, the accuracy of natural language understanding, computer vision, uh, um, and also we've seen the progress about the safety improvements, on autonomous vehicles, the cost of robots and sensors. So one can make a pretty reasonable projection for the 10 to 20 year horizon. So I, I, so I think the projections that, that I did make in the book are, I would say are 80% confidence. But I would also add a caveat that um, there are many things that will happen in 20 years that I, would, I was unable to predict. Yeah. Just like 20 years ago, if you asked me to predict the future of mobile, and then I would probably miss most of, you know, <clears throat> I would probably miss Uber. I would probably possibly get Netflix, and I might or might not get Facebook and TikTok. So it's, uh, I, I, think, I think what I did predict have a high likelihood of happening, but there will be many more that I failed to predict, and that will be upside surprise for us. I mean, your stories are <clears throat> perhaps somewhat utopian for some of the readers, but uh, not really the first story. The first story that you call the golden elephant. Mm -hmm. It's a love story, a teenage love story, uh, which plays in Mumbai, India, and which is a story about uh, unintended consequences. Can you describe uh, that, please? Sure. <clears throat> One of uh, my favorite documentaries is A Social Dilemma. I think it portrays a very accurate picture of uh, internet companies that try to use AI to help them make money by showing us videos and content uh, that gets us to click because they know who we are. And, um, and one of their conclusions was that uh, because the uh, internet companies who run the AI algorithms, their interests are not aligned with ours. So they will help uh, show us content to help them make money uh, potentially at our expense. So this story is meant to take that one step further, which is to say, even when the interests are aligned and it can even still uh, shape our, it can still do have unintended externalities. Um, and, and the specific example was an insurance company that happens to also be the provider of social e-commerce and food and restaurant and travel apps. So they know so much about a person that they can go ahead and help you minimize your uh, insurance risks, which means help us be healthy and therefore reduce our insurance premiums. Seems like a win-win, a win for them and win for us. But actually um, the program proceeded to uncover some things and try to influence the person because it just knows too much about one, a girl um, and it would predict there's a high likelihood that if she ended up marrying um, a new boy that she had met, uh, there would be a high likelihood of her health issues going up and, um, uh, and, 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 and try to prevent it by, by apps not showing her content. 
that would lead her to uh, to 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 date or, or and later marry the boy. So it went out and influenced uh, and tried to interfere with love, even though both the insurance company and the girl wanted to stay healthy. So I think it's intended to show really people can have no bad intentions, but still end up hurting you. And that's how powerful AI is. And, and we need to be careful. Is there a way out of it? Uh, well, there are many possible solutions for it. I think first is awareness. I think uh, most AI companies and engineers are not aware that they're building programs that can impact people's lives. So I think just showing how unintended consequences can happen, the engineers can out of their own volition, uh, try to minimize and reduce such occurrences and companies will have policies, smart tools will be in place and then perhaps government regulations will, um, will um, ensure that uh, the negative things um, uh, are minimized. So I think you know, awareness is the first step. The ultimate solution is, is will be some combination of government regulations, uh, company self-discipline, industry media working as a watchdog, good tools to minimize the happening, and the uh, engineers uh, being more aware. How realistic is it to create a unbiased databases? So for example, let's take ImageNet, which has certain biases uh, implicitly ingrained uh, is it unrealistic to think of creating a new image net which does not have certain kinds of biases or is that utopian um i think we we can always do better and we should do a good job and we have not done a good job um so we should definitely do the work i don't think it's possible to make it completely unbiased it's just like people have complained that uh, you know, standardized tests like SAT and GRE will have some racial preferences uh, for people because of the types of problems they put are perhaps more suitable for uh, people in better economic conditions. And, and it's really hard to eliminate that completely, but I think we should continue to do a good job. Uh, you could try to balance the, you know, racial, gender, and many other issues that we care deeply about and do the best we can. But while we do all that to protect ourselves from AI, to make sure we're doing AI for good, we should not lose sight that people are much more prejudiced and much more uh, biased than, uh, than AI if we do a good job on the AI. So I think the goal for AI is not to be perfect, but to be, uh, do a better job than people and their means of detecting uh, mistakes and correcting them. Uh, that's probably a more realistic goal to shoot for. In your second story called Gods uh, Behind the Masks, uh, you talk about deep fakes. I mean, today one has the impression that uh, the truth is just a prop in an ocean of lies. So how, how do you see that uh, evolving over the next uh, couple of decades? Yeah, we've gone from fake news to deep fake and then the faked images, voice, audio. It will be in news. It will be used to um, um, muscling people and, um, um, and it will be used even in courtroom evidence. So that's the likely path. The, uh, we're already at a point when the human eyes can barely tell the difference between real and uh, fake. And we'll soon be at the point where even computers will have a hard time telling. Um, and whether or not computers can tell will largely depend how much compute power you have. So it becomes a arms race between the bad guys and the good guys on who's got more compute power. So that's kind of the future we have in the next 20 years. And what that means is uh, for authoritative websites, it's incredibly important that they do absolutely everything they can to control the quality of the content, to authenticate it, and not to put you know, spurious or uh, user uploaded content. So at least we have some degree of uh, authority for you know, the government websites, UN website, or you know, hospitals website, or, some, um, or, or major news channels. We try to do that. The other thing is that um, there should be some kind of a deep fake scanning mechanism that all websites can do, just like they check for uh, spam or uh, viruses. So that's, again, something everyone should do. But even 
with all that, there will still be uh, deep fakes and fake content that will get through these checks and confuse people. I think we as a human race just need to get used to it and um, always be doubtful. Don't spread news when you're unsure, uh, verify. Uh, trust but verify and and then there should be means of um, marking spreading complaining uh, appealing um, and uh, content when you see that's um, that's clearly fake content so all that should be put in place and and there is a possible ending uh, I describe in the in the book a possible set of technologies that could authenticate content at the time of capture so that then will be able to ensure that anything that's authenticated as as captured would not be um, modified and deep faked. Uh, but that requires um, an upgrade or replacement of every capture mo uh, module, like a camera, a microphone, or a phone, or a computer. And that's likely to take uh, 20 years just for that upgrade cycle. So we can look forward to that, but it won't happen in 20 years. Why not simply hold uh, Google and Facebook uh to the same standards as the uh, newspaper industry. Wouldn't that <clears throat> solve it? Uh, well, because the amount of computation it takes for them to uh, you know, scan a trillion photos compared mm -hmm. to uh, you know, uh, UN org scanning a thousand photos, it's, it's really too large. Uh, I do think there are ways to hold them to some standard. I, I don't think it'd be reasonable to punish them for you know, having two deep fakes, but there, I think there should be some public measure of fake news and deep fake score, like how many are on Google, how many are on Facebook. And, and we should watch to see if on a month by month basis, their scores are improving or not. And maybe that could be a part of corporate ESG. Uh, so that if they're too tolerant of, um, of deep fakes, maybe investors will choose not to invest in them or their brand would become tarnished. So I think some score on their efforts and success in fighting fake content, I think is a good thing. Uh, a law preventing that is probably too tough because it's uh, sometimes just not feasible. Sometimes, uh, you know, with um, uh, uh, success of these scan technologies, uh, something just cannot easily be detected by, even if you're a good guy with a fair amount of computation. You have a story on AI in education all the twin sparrows about uh, young twins in Korea. So do you foresee that in 20 years time, children, like young children, three, four, five, six, uh, will grow up with AI companions and they may have a more intimate relationship to them than to their parents and to their friends? Uh, the last part, I don't know. Uh, I do think they will have AI companions. Uh, some of it will be entertainment. Um, you know, kids have always had that, whether it's a Cabbage Patch dolls or, or Bob Barbie or G.I. Joe. You know, uh, even I had them when I was a, a child, um, but they were just inanimate hard objects back then. But now they will become lively. They'll come to life on your phone, perhaps um, in 3D when you wear your VR glasses or AR glasses, and uh, they, they, can, they can just be immersively around you with all these new AR, VR technologies. And, and also they will converse in increasingly more natural language because they don't have to know everything the human knows. They just have to know how to converse with you in a, in a way that, uh, that, that you like and um, uh, that represents their character. And I think these companions can help kids um, learn things that they need practice. You know, if they're falling behind in multiplication, there would be nice ways to fun in the fun ways to teach them at multiplication before they go into division in the classroom tomorrow. Or there could be uh, interesting um, uh, ways to recast the math problems. If someone likes uh, basketball, then the math problems could become basketball uh, games. Or um, if someone likes a superhero or some animated fun and uh, a fun animal, uh, a bear or whatever, uh, that can be the companion and, and the teacher. And that has a way of potentially making education also fun. 
So, um, so there can be targeted education. It's just like today, uh, Facebook and TikTok are so good at targeting us with content that, that will keep us click clicking. We can use that technology, same technology for good, you know, target content to the students so that they are naturally incentivized and um, to, 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 to learn. And, and I think that applied at an individualistic level will help each child learn at a different pace that suits the child's uh, preference and, and passion. I think that's going to be much more effective as an educational tool. And, and the teachers can still have, play a strong role as a mentor on um, uh, helping to improve the child's uh, curiosity and creativity and um, communication skills and teamwork and empathy and compassion and really become more teachers, more of a mentor uh, for developing the right values and skill sets while the AI companion is on a, in a targeted way, making learning fun and, and personalized. I think that combination will help uh, the next generation grow up to be much better uh, than the previous generations. I mean, you, you were, or you're careful not to go into whether people might develop uh, relationships to uh, AI bots. I mean, Josef uh, Weizenbaum, uh, MIT professor, he wrote one of the first uh, chatbot programs in the 60s you know, called Eliza. And uh, compared to today's standard, it was you know, like incredibly simple. It was just basically rephrasing what the person said uh, back as a, as, a, as a question. And he was shocked by the reaction of the people that who developed, uh, many of them developed a relationship to the program. So now with the GPT-3 and uh, GPT-4, whenever it comes, uh, I mean, I might even think uh, that you know, people might prefer to communicate with uh, chatbots rather than with their spouse or their friends because the chatbots uh, combined with uh, bio sensors will just know how to treat you so much better than anyone else. So you may, you may, you may just prefer them. Would that be a danger in your life? Uh, in my lifetime, that danger may happen. It wouldn't happen to me, <laughs> if that's what you mean. Uh, I, I, I'm a still a believer that people connect um, uh, truly, uh, you know, um, soul to soul and um, uh, heart to heart because, because we're the, made out of the same organic materials and, you know, we feel a sense of love and empathy for people, but, but not for robots, particularly when, when I know that the robots may be emulating what we say and what we do and maybe uh, even appears interesting or human-like but, but inside they're just matching texts and, and, sent, and, and showing me, they're just a pattern matcher. There is no self-awareness, no emotion, no connection to me. So uh, while I do think uh, AI will emulate people better and better over the next 20 years, and in these 20 years, there will be people who think they've made a friend with AI or even they fall in love with AI. But it's important, I would recommend anyone watching, uh, if that happens to you, just remind yourself, it, uh, it won't love you back, even if you decide to love it. If that's still okay, then I guess go for it, but uh, make sure you remember that. Okay. You have a story on uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, and um, I'm quoting one sentence of the story where you say that uh, Aiko, that's the, uh, the character, main character of the story, feels practically blind without her XR contact lenses. And you said, you know, you imagine that uh, that may be the case for many of us in the years to come. Can you explain what, what you mean? Uh, sure. Uh, as there are more um, smart applications built into these glasses, Right. One of the big problems with today's AR VR is that uh, the, the headsets are so big and they used to be tethered, they're heavy, they look nerdy. And, um, um, uh, and also there's, there are issues with uh, resolution and realism and, and people get dizzy. So over the next 20 years, all, a lot of these problems will get fixed. So uh, there will probably be two major form factors for AR VR. Um, at least for AR, 
uh, because you need to see through them. So one is just glasses like these that are no thicker, no heavier than my glasses. And when I put on, I will see very smart um, uh, uh, overlay of content. If I'm having a video conference with you, I will see you in 3D sitting in my chair and it will feel realistic as opposed to the current flat uh, Zoom interface that we have. Uh, similarly, when I uh, walk on the street, it will uh, know where I am and give me suggestions about um, your wife's anniversary is coming, your anniversary with your wife is coming up. Uh, this store was where you got her a present last year. Would you like to buy a matching present this time? So it will overlay suggestions and identifications uh, and, and guide me along in, in very non-intrusive and helpful ways. And that's what AR will become uh, in general. And of course, in particular applications, it'll be a fun game, the Pokemon Go. Uh, uh, po Pokemon Go becoming uh, uh, working over glasses um, and, and also can be used for education. I can talk to historical characters or can be used in training. I can, in virtual space, learn to fix um, an airplane or something. So I think all of these will happen uh, through glasses. And it's a little bit speculative to hope they'll also work for contact lenses. Uh, there are people who are developing to put IC and the proper technologies on contact lenses. So I think with glasses, based on the current rate of improving clarity and uh, reducing weight um, and uh, size, we should be on track to have um, uh, basically AR glasses like these in, in a 10 year kind of time frame. And contact lens is a little bit more speculative, but it looks like products are beginning to happen. Research is beginning to happen. So, so I think that will become a dramatic moment when after decades of work that people have put on AR and VR, uh, finally it, it can go mainstream. What will a Zoom meeting in 2041 look like? So uh, we could just wear glasses and uh, or contact lenses um, and basically visualize people who would uh, sit around us and people can uh, just like in real life can hold up objects they want to present or um, uh, uh, basically it's kind of like what Mark Zuckerberg sure shared recently of, uh, of the space that he was in except he was animated and this one would be realistic I think that'd be doable for people who like to stay in their office and use their, their computer or phone um, those spaces can also be rendered but uh, the, the, the most accurate one would be if you wear the glasses and sit in a table with open chairs, the chairs would appear like they're filled with uh, other people you're having the meeting with virtually, but it's uh, almost indistinguishable uh, with the real thing. Okay, thank you. I'd like to um, zoom into the story about uh, the future of work. Uh, there are I guess today's you know two two opinions: the optimists and the pessimists. And the optimists say, uh, I mean, technology has always uh, replaced uh, uh, people's job, and it goes back to at least uh, Aristotle. But people always find uh, found new jobs, and so it will not be different uh, this time either. And then the pessimists say, well, this time it will be different because uh, the new jobs that people may want to or could could have tried in the past, they will also be taken up by, by AI and robotics. So which side are you on? Um, I actually agree with both sides, uh, depending on short term or long term. Um, <clears throat> I think in short term, uh, AI will replace a bunch of routine jobs and routine tasks. Uh, what AI is really good at is doing things that are repetitive and routine, or, um, work like you know customer service, um, uh, telemarketing, uh, simple assembly line work, uh, pushing a cart around, uh, delivering packages, the uh, waiter waiting on the table, and and a little bit later driving. These are tasks that AI will increasingly be able to do, and they're largely routine tasks. So um, they will be the first to go because AI by definition, according to your pessimistic second outlook, um, AI by definition uh, replaces human endeavor, human perception, human manipulation. So by, by replacing it, of course it will take the jobs away. And of course it is different from previous technological revolutions and it will be a, a low hanging fruit. Entrepreneur will naturally be inclined to build a product that replaces the human jobs 
uh, one at a time and companies will naturally be inclined to purchase such products and services um, uh, for some 20, 30, 40% of jobs that will be replaced in the next 20 years. So that part is extra on top of other technological revolutions. But if we look at a longer term, I also think AI will create many opportunities. Um, it will create opportunities in new jobs with all this data, we need people to label it with all the um, uh, new robots, people need to repair it, people need to program AI. And, and also AI will indirectly create a bunch of jobs because in the service sector, um, I think as uh, AI does more of the physical product building, et cetera, um, only people is, can possibly do human to human service jobs like tour guide, concierge, healthcare services, taking care of uh, elderly, et cetera. So those jobs will probably grow as people live longer and, and want and are more willing to pay money for, uh, for uh, humans, human to human services. So I think those jobs will grow. And then I think there will be many jobs that we don't know what there are, there will be, but they will be created ultimately by AI. Just like 20 years ago, we couldn't have predicted Uber driver would be a category of jobs that were created in tens of millions, uh, e even though we understood what internet was able to do, AI would do the same. So that's where you know, we uh, have to resort to a bit of um, optimism and um, belief in historical evidence that every time a technology is invented, whether it's PC, the internet, electricity, um, or, or airplane or, or what have you, uh, ultimately, it does more good for society and creates more jobs than it destroys. But the, the key word is ultimately. So uh, if I were to draw an estimate, I would say in the 10 to 15 year time frame, more jobs would, would be gone, fewer jobs would, would be created, although many would be as well. But if you look at a 20 to 30 year horizon, probably many jobs will, will arise as people are educated in an AI native world and as AI people um, embrace it and, and use it to create uh, opportunities for people. So short time, short term challenge, long term optimistic. We are human beings better than AI and robotics in 2041. Well, for sure, um, we have uh, self awareness, we have um, emotion, we feel for each other, we have compassion, empathy and we connect to each other. And, and very likely we, we are more creative in the sense we can make up a new art form or come up with ideas and concepts that didn't exist before. AI is mostly optimizing given a pre-existing concept. So these I think are the core things and they also form uh, key things for our children and grandchildren to make sure that um, their upbringing and their education gives them the creativity as well as the compassion and empathy. Now, let me play a devil's advocate here. Uh, so first point, creativity. We had the world uh, chess champion, mm. Vladimir Kramnik on AI for Good. Mm. And he said that Alpha Zero plays just like someone from another planet, it's just, you know, if a human being were to play like that, it would be unbelievably creative. Mm. So AI can be very creative. AI is also going to be used maybe in coming up with plots. Uh, AI could have helped uh, write you the book perhaps. Uh, so uh, I don't think that humans are that special with respect to uh, creativity and that AI will uh, surpass them eventually. Well, that's fair enough. There, are, I think based on our um, normal definition of creativity, AI is chipping away at, at it, okay? Uh, but when I say creative, I meant more, you know, Mozart and Picasso uh, or, a, um, or Einstein, that they discover things that really didn't exist before on complex issues. On um, chess, a uh, chess style, chess is really not a real world application. Right, things that have real value to humans are things that are real-world applications. You know how to um, how to invent a new drug to fight a particular kind of cancer, um, and um, chess is a human-fabricated game with um, very limited um, uh, func uh, functions. 
So the reason Alpha Zero works well is because it's a human fabricated game with very clear measures. So in so think of it: if you live living in the chess world, um, your 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 evaluation function is very perfectly accurate, right? Uh, measured by the the, quali- the 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 board position and pieces you have. But in real life, things are much more complex. You, it, it, our lives are not chess pieces. Our lives are, you know, running a company is just not just an issue of how do we create more revenue. It's more about how do I balance my growth business with our with our um, uh, cash cow business. It's about uh, balancing employee morale, customer satisfaction, corporate brand. So you know, it's you can't take a job of a CEO who is creatively managing a company and say, hey, that's like playing a chess game because chess game is really a um, incredibly simple human fabricated game in which the um, evaluation is uh, so trivial that AI could master it. In real life, we have not been there. Now, of course, you can always say AI will improve with more computation, new algorithms, and, and we'll see. But, uh, but to be sure, uh, when I started saying uh, AI doesn't have creativity, you know, five or 10 years ago, uh, I now say it with less confidence than I did before. Mm-hmm. And also with respect to, to empathy, we touched on it a little bit earlier. I mean, an argument that's often being made is that people are just better uh, than uh, technology and showing empathy. But, you know, again, uh, computers will be able just to know how to treat you much better. So I, I'm not convinced that uh, people are really that good at showing empathy and they will eventually also be surpassed by AI tools. Uh, some people are very poor at showing empathy. <clears throat> that's why they're not very successful or uh, popular. Um, so that's for sure. But um, empathy is, I think, it's a difficult to have an argument about this because, you know, I, my definition of empathy, by definition, is a human to human thing. If you're mm-hmm. not a human, I am just not going to have empathy for you. That's the way I would, would feel. Mm-hmm. Or would I believe that you have empathy for me. But Arguably, you could say, hey, Kai Fu is an AI technologist. He doesn't want to have empathy with anything that doesn't have empathy back. And maybe that's what's kind of driving this. Mm-hmm. But, but I would also say that, you know, even when AI fully emulates humans, many people still don't want it. You know, I actually have um, a known entrepreneur who's built a very cool robot for people in the elderly home. It's got to do with, does all kinds of cool things. I won't go into details here, but he finds the number one used function by the elderly that the robot is carrying is customer service. And, and the elderly is clicking on the customer service button for the only purpose they do that is to have a human they can talk to. Um, you know, they call through and say, can I help you? What's wrong with the robot? Oh, I just want to tell you about my granddaughter. You look how cute she is. So, you know, people want to share these things with another human, not with a robot. So that fundamental need until that dies out I think will uh, make it hard for AI to become truly empathetic. E- and even if they exhibit everything that humans do or good humans do, mm-hmm. qualified empathetic humans do, uh, people uh, probably will not accept them, at least not the current generation. So what job advice do you have to uh, today's uh, young people who are trying to figure out what to study or which, uh, which career to follow? Uh, I think follow your heart is the most important to do something you're passionate about, you're good at. I mean, young people are fortunate to be born in this decade when AI will start to take over the routine work and liberate us to do the things we want to do. That's really liberating for us. At the same time, um, as you enter a competitive uh, job market, you're not just competing against humans, you're competing with ever improving AI. So um, you better do something you're, you love because that's when you will you know, try to do such a good job and be thinking about it when you're, whether you're sleeping or eating or showering and, and then you will excel. That's probably the most important. And also, you know, put more emphasis on uh, the creativity and um, uh, empathetic uh, people-to-people connection uh, type of work. I think it's always been a good idea to develop soft skills uh, that you can gain respect and trust. And it's always great to you know, be, be creative, out-of-box thinking. Those skills are now more important than ever now that um, 
they're likely the only two things that um, uh, that AI um, appears cannot do for another 20 years. Mm-hmm. I'd like to get your opinion on two pieces of regulation that's coming out of Europe. The first one is uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. I mean, it received very high praise uh, when it uh, became law, but it has received uh, criticism lately. And the big thing about uh, GDPR is that the fines were very high. A company could be charged with up to 4% of a company's global revenue. But if you you look at the rulings, uh, they haven't been really that many. I mean, the the latest I was able to find was uh, Amazon was fined in July, 750 million euros by the Luxembourg Privacy Regular uh, Authority. And the other thing, which is uh, like very annoying for users are these pop-up windows. Uh, Whenever you go to a website, uh, they're not standardized. You don't really know what you're signing up for. I mean, you don't read that. It doesn't seem to be scalable. So what what is your take on GDPR? Uh, I think the positive side is that it has ignited the whole world um, to to realize personal data is something we all need to pay attention to. Uh, U.S. and China both followed suit with similar laws. So I think uh, awareness and starting to regulate it is a good point. I think we should view it as a um, as something that is a moving pivot, right? The initial version probably won't get it right, and we'll have to tweak it until we get it right. Uh, I would say a few things is that uh, first, um, getting people to personally dis- tick every box is unrealistic. We all know that we tick all kinds of boxes without reading this. We just want to move on. So transferring responsibility to the user and say, hey, you ticked it, it's your problem. That's probably not a good idea. So we need to explore that further. Uh, The other thing is if you go too far and remove all the data from the Google Amazons of the world and give it back to the individuals, then their apps will stop working. So it's important to find a middle ground where we allow them to have some data and they owe us some responsibilities back, but not overly, not make it overly restrictive because when their AI stops working, uh, we all pay a big price for the, the lower quality of, of the app. So, so I, I think as long as it's looked at as a you know, moving, improving a set of regulations that balance the need to protect personal data and the need to develop good technologies. Um, And also, oh, one last thing is they should also keep in mind that some of these technological issues can be solved potentially by technological problems, uh, technology solutions. So for example, can the use of privacy computing, such as um, um, federated learning, uh, uh, let you have your cake and eat it too? That is, protect your data to be safe in a place that you designate, uh, but allow models to be trained there so that the global AI, the the app can can make use of your data without ever uh, seeing it directly. So those technologies might actually end up being the solution. Regulation is rarely the only thing that's needed to control the proper growth of the technology. If you look at electricity, you know, there's a circuit breaker, the internet, there are antivirus software. These are not regulations, but technological solutions to make the technology safe for us. So uh, mm-hmm. allow some room and invest in some research for these technologies to address the problems in addition to regulations. In uh, April of this year, the European Commission issued a draft called the AI uh, Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act. So uh, it is not a a law yet, but it has been in consultation with uh, many stakeholders for a number of years. So the uh, European Commission plans to take what it calls a risk-based approach. So it doesn't regulate the technology as such, but uh, it lists uh, concrete uh, risk uh, cases, use cases. And so for example, uh, there are risk cases which the European Union would then categorize as unacceptable risk. And so those use cases would be prohibited. For example, social scoring would be one such uh, application that would not be uh, acceptable. The next category would be high risk uh, use cases. For example, if you recruit people or if you wanna sell medical devices, they would fall into that. And uh, so these things would be permitted, but uh, subject to um, uh, conformity assessment uh, procedures. 
And then a third, the third lowest category would be a, what it calls a transparency risk. So for example, bots that do impersonations would fall under this category. And so new uh, human beings would have to be uh, notified if they are interacting with an um, AI system. And uh, uh, humans would also have to be notified uh, that they are exposed to emotional recognition or biometric uh, systems. So what, what do you think of, uh, of that approach? I think the general approach is a good one. And um, some comments are, uh, there will initially be a set of uh, tests people will have to check to see if how to apply these things, right? For example, uh, is a credit card, is a credit score a form of uh, social score, right? We all have credit scores and they, uh, they will end up hurting our ability to get a mortgage or not in, in Western countries. How, where do you draw the line? I think that's potentially one uh, ch challenging area. Um, I think transparency and disclosure is good also, um, but there are some cases where uh, um, I understand there are also places where human in the loop is required. And I think that may make it economically non-viable for some applications to always put a human in the loop. So, so I think you know, I can nitpick specific issues, but I think a general guidance that's risk-based um, mm -hmm. for that's suitable for the, the country, continent, or culture, I think is a good start. But as before with GDPR, I think it's um, important to uh, leave flexibility for tweaking because I doubt we can get it right the first time. And also, we should also look at possibility of using technology as a way to guide towards the safe use of, of this rather than just regulations. Mm -hmm. What will be the impact of AI on, on developing countries? I mean, the superpowers, uh, AI superpowers of the United States and China, and uh, democratization, democratization of AI is one of the passwords, but is that really feasible? And just to give you a, a trivial example, the ITU is running a, a challenge, a competition called Machine Learning in 5G. And some, some of our uh, participants, this challenge say, they don't have the compute resources to actually train their AI models. You know, they may need 20 days to train an AI model. So you know, they, they don't have a, they're not part of, they're not students uh, of a rich university or a professional in a, in a company. So how, how, could, how could they, how could developing countries uh, see to catch up to the uh, AI train? Yeah, um, I, I think we're unfortunately going down a path where there is a, a growing inequality caused by both the use of AI, the power of AI, and the difficulty of um, uh, staying on top of AI. I think that causes inequality issues within countries and also between countries. Um, and, and that's why, you know, United Nations, um, I think is a great uh, organization that can try to address this issue. Um, I think com countries, um, if I were a, uh, giving advice to a poorer country or a very developing state uh, that can, clearly cannot give, you know, advanced education to everybody, uh, I would probably consider a gift and talented program um, with resources being allocated for that. I realize this is a controversial issue as well. Uh, some people believe in egalitarian uh, education, but if your resources are truly limited and is limiting the future of your country, then that's something you, you might consider. And in fact, you might partner with another country that has great AI education and send your best students on a scholarship to those countries. And maybe those wealthy countries will pay for the scholarship because some of the kids who go will stay there and that that's talent they attract, but then they educate and send, send some back. If you think about a very uh, critical growth for China, back in, in, in you know, 40 years ago or so was the, the, the moment that um, I forget which US president, he had a talk with uh, uh, the president of China and said, well, send students over. And, and basically that helped educate the first group of Chinese students, some of whom stayed in the US so that they became big contributors to the American technologies, but some went back to China and they became professors and founders of companies. So emulate that model to send your top people um, to 
top countries for study and understanding some will not come back, but others will come back and form the nucleus of what you need in technologists. I'm picking up a buzzword uh, that was, uh, you know, came up in the Q&A here, which is uh, the buzzword of singularity. I mean, you're, you're not a big, uh, I understand from your book, you're not a big fan uh, about the artificial general intelligence discussion. I mean, you, you wrote here, I consider obsession with uh, artificial general intelligence to be a narcissistic human tendency to view ourselves as a gold standard. So any thoughts on singularity, artificial general intelligence? Yeah, that comment uh, was, I, I, I was certainly meant it, but also at the same time, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the singularity argument, right? Clearly AI is growing at exponential pace. So if you draw the things that humans can do and the things AI can do, this bubble is growing so much bigger. Um, I just think to claim that because one bubble is growing so much bigger than the other does not mean the, second, the, the, the first bubble will completely become a superset and take over. Um, and there are things innate to humans that I believe may be in, 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 inimitable by AI, um, creativity, um, our, our self-awareness and, and uh, may, may not be uh, uh, copyable. Um, um, but I, I totally acknowledge that uh, the compute is growing exponentially and the capabilities are growing very rapidly. And, and just like you know, the, the speed of cars and airplanes and spaceships have gone way past human capabilities, it doesn't mean they become AGI. Um, and I think one aspect is I think there's something innate to human and I can't really prove it. We can choose to believe in the sanctity of human soul or not. Each of us can have his or her opinion. The other is that uh, for AI to truly scale and, uh, and truly be, take over everything, uh, there needs to be a exponential growth, not only in data and compute, but also algorithms. And if we look at breakthrough algorithms, there just haven't, hasn't been that many maybe one big one or three or four small ones in the last um, uh, you know, three, uh, six decades. And, and if we really want um, to be able to do what humans do with common sense and creativity and um, um, uh, ability to uh, analyze and um, um, initi understand concepts and uh, um, have self-awareness and emotion and, and so on, uh, we don't know at all how that works with humans, how we feel what we feel. We don't understand how our brain, brains work. And that's going to require decades of research to understand how it works with us. And it's going to potentially require dozens of breakthroughs for AI to emulate all of that. And, and why worry about this tiny little sliver that's human, uh, that AI has hard time emulating, and not think about all those other things that AI can do with you know, creating value and the uh, doing routine work and saving time and, and, and making money for us. So that's why I think, um, you know, it's natural for people to be self-centered and, and, and narcissistic in comparing everything to us. You know, when, when there's a movie about aliens or pets or AI, we always compare them to us. They all gain self-awareness, but, but why does a dog or, a, or, or an alien or a robot want to be human? They're just, you know, a robot and AI is just a supercomputing engine. Let it compute. Don't, it doesn't want to be human. Uh, I, think, I think we want it to be human, but, but, it, but it's uh, illogical to demand that it become something it's not. Uh, let's finish on a, on a positive note that the impact of AI in health uh, is uh, maybe arguably uh, among the most significant uh, impacts of AI. Are you wearing a smartwatch, uh, a smartwatch or some wearable device that's uh, taking biometric data? I'm doing more than that. Uh, I'm, war I'm doing uh, co continuous uh, glucose monitoring. Uh, I'm wearing an o uh, oxygen uh, ring at, at night. And also I measure my pulse and all of that is fed into a AI longevity platform that actually gathers all this wearable data. And what's more exciting is I am, I belong to a um, healthcare clinic that uh, captures my genetic sequencing uh, and also annually does a very detailed blood check and does a full body MRI. And all that image is fed to an AI algorithm 
that compares me with other healthy people of my age and younger age. And then the AI and the doctor together uh, help me uh, adjust my lifestyle and, and improve my exercise and medicine so that I can um, be younger and younger, quote unquote, uh, if, if one's age is measured by the, the numbers that come out of these tests. I think that's a wonderfully motivating and fun way uh, for me to be healthier and, and younger. So, um, so actually I've seen my numbers improve. Uh, this year, I'm uh, six years younger than I was last year based on their measures. <laughs> Very motivated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you continue like that, we can still, and if I'm still alive, maybe we could still talk in 2041 and see whether your predictions uh, or which ones have come true. Yes, so be great. <laughs> with that, I would like to thank you very much for having joined us uh, on today's Cyber for Good and uh, all the best uh, with your book and your personal health and uh, everything thank else. You. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, so for our viewers, we have uh, the Net Promoter Score. If you please check uh, how you liked uh, today's session. And then if you check out our program, AI for Good, we have almost daily programming. So please take a look and join us for our next uh, session. Thank you very much.